once upon a time. There was a beautiful city ruled by a kind and just king. There were few laws, just enough for the happiness and safety of the people. But in the evening time, the king would walk in the city streets and talk with his subjects and take delight in the labors of their hands. And he would encourage them by his example to be generous and kind and care for others and to care for their land. The people were happy. But in time, they began to take that happiness for granted. And one dark winter's night, something slipped in the gates past the unwary guards and hid in the shadows. And to whomever would listen, it would whisper, saying, Is this king really good? What is he keeping from you? Are you really free as long as he is ruling over you? And a discontent spread amongst them. Until one sad day, they gathered in the palace square and demanded of the king that they would not have him rule over them anymore. And a tear fell down the king's gentle face. And he bowed and turned and left. A shadow fell on the city that day. They fought amongst themselves, and the strongest of them seized power and ruled over them cruelly. They quarreled amongst themselves and were divided and went to war. The countryside was blighted and the old trees cut down and the land dug up to make weapons. Rulers became tyrants and were toppled only to be replaced by other tyrants. There were wars and rumors of wars, and the city slipped into decay. And they became bitter and vengeful and made terrible enemies. And they forgot about the old king or dismissed the stories as childish. Occasionally, someone, one would travel deep into the forest and return with wild eyes and rumors that the old king was still alive. But mostly, they were ignored as fools. Many years later, rumors began to spread that someone was wandering the countryside, befriending ordinary people, and warning them that the old city was coming to an end. The rulers were furious and panicked and conspired together, saying that he had come back to take the city from them. And then one spring morning, there was a great commotion outside the city gates, and a vast crowd gathered and began to celebrate a strange figure riding up to the city, not on a war horse, but on a donkey. You know, Jesus often told stories a little bit like that to help people understand what was going on in his kingdom and to provoke a response. How were the people going to respond? What would the leaders do? Would they choose to restore the king to his rightful place? Where would I be in that story? We're at this significant moment in our story. It's Palm Sunday and we celebrate the arrival of our king. A king who comes not in power and splendor, but humble and riding upon a donkey. And he invites each of us to choose which kingdom we will serve. The story of the triumphal entry is famous. It's an iconic picture of the kind of king that Jesus is. And he would say to us, really, there are only two kingdoms in this world. There are the kingdoms of men, and there is the kingdom of God. And each of us must choose where our loyalty lies. The story of Jesus arriving on a donkey is really significant. It's, as I say, an iconic picture of the kind of king that Jesus is. You know the old saying that power corrupts. And what does absolute power do? It corrupts absolutely. And um, there was a time when we took that seriously. There was a time when we realized that you needed to put limits on the power of rulers because that power was corrupting. 
but we are in danger of forgetting the wisdom of those who went before. We are witnessing the rise once more of autocratic rulers unwilling to be accountable to anyone. And we have to take the exercise of power seriously on all levels, starting here at church. And Jesus is the model of gentle, humble power. We have to hold power in a Christ-like way. We have to resist as best we can anybody abusing that power. That symbol of Jesus on a donkey is clearly hugely significant. It's mentioned four times in the seven verses of our reading. And do you understand why that matters so much? Because what it is a picture of is God exercising his authority in a really gentle way. Never forcing it, but in humility and gentleness. He makes an invitation for us to accept his kingship. God has always exercised his authority in that way. And it's a sort of an absolute inversion of the way that earthly authority all too often works. As Jesus said, whoever would be great must become your servant. And Jesus is the greatest of all. So it's a really powerful picture of how power should be held, how authority should be exercised in humility and service and sacrifice. It's also a symbol of peace. You may have heard in our, um, the Old Testament passage that we read a few minutes ago, the, um, that lovely sense, you know, the contrast between Jesus not coming on a war horse, but on a gentle donkey. And these are the words from Zechariah. Rejoice greatly, O daughter Zion. See, your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey. And he will take away the chariots and the war horses and break the sword and the battle bow. And he will proclaim peace to the nations and to the end of the earth. Jesus' kingdom is a kingdom of peace. And he will fight a battle, a battle to the death. But that battle will take place upon the cross. And it's a a battle against sin and evil and even death itself. And it is a battle which will free us from those powers. Jesus is the king of peace. But one further thing to say on this Palm Sunday is that the arrival of that peaceful, humble king is an arrival which requires a response. Verse 8 says this. Many people spread their cloaks on the road and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the field. He is the humble king, but he is also the true king. And we need to choose who we are serving. And if Jesus is the true king, then we need to choose to accept his rule that rule which sets us free. Don't forget that the freedom that we have is hard won by Christ. Note that Jesus doesn't demand this. In fact, he doesn't even ask for it. And yet we must choose where we stand in this story. We need to make a choice who we are serving. Is it not the case that the gentle, humble king should be worthy of greater honor and a more vocal loyalty than the shrill demands of the kings of this world? So here is my question for you this evening. What does it look like for you to respond to the arrival of this humble king? Did you see that many people spread their cloaks on the road? And I think that's a really interesting picture. And my question is going to be what it looks like for you to spread your cloak on the road. Why do they do it? Well, I think what they're doing is they're sort of, they're making a royal procession out of the rocky road. That they're sort of ushering in the king and his kingdom. And that what they're doing in order to do that is they're sacrificing something of their status and their comfort. Because in an ancient world, a cloak is that. 
A cloak says who you are, what kind of person you are. And the more powerful or wealthy, the nicer a cloak that you would have. But whether poor or rich, what they're doing is they're taking off their cloak, making themselves a little vulnerable and less comfortable, and laying down that status on the road in quite a sacrificial way. A donkey's going to ride across that cloak. What does it look like for you to sacrifice something of your status and your comfort and your honor in recognition of the true king? Here is one reflection on that. It was a really public thing to do. People would have been watching all round, and those who lay their cloaks on the road and waved their palm branches, would have, it, would have, it would have been very much a public thing, and probably a slightly risky thing, given that the authorities would have been watching too. Here's my question for you this Palm Sunday. Do people know that you are a follower of Jesus Christ? Do people know that you are a follower of Jesus Christ? I think all too often we think of it as a very sort of private thing, and it is, of course. But we're also slightly uncomfortable with people's reactions to it. And there can be a cost to it, can't there? People can think we are foolish or respect us less if they know that we are Christians. And yet that's what is being asked here to make a sacrifice in terms of something of our status and our comfort. And I suppose the question I would ask you to ask yourself is that if I have made this choice to choose this king, this kingdom, then do people know that? John the Baptist once said, um, I must decrease so that he must increase. And that he was willing to sacrifice his status in order to honor Christ. If we are going to seek to honor Jesus instead of ourself, well, we need to make some sacrifice. We have to say, this isn't about me or my status, but it's about honoring the true king. And so Palm Sunday. We choose to honor the true king. We lay down upon the road something of our status and our comfort. We nail our colors to the mast. We choose to seek first the kingdom of God, to say, your will be done, your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. And that does not come without cost. And so this week, will you carry with you your palm cross to remind you that we celebrate not just the joy and the triumph and the victory of this, but also the cost, first and foremost to Jesus himself, but to each of us who come after him and must also take up our cross to follow. Amen.